The Master Keys MK750 is Cooler Master's most premium mechanical gaming keyboard with perky RGB lighting, the distinct illuminated light bar across the front, and a premium braided cable with an actual USB Type-C plug. There's a removable soft magnetic wrist rest, and it's available with a variety of genuine Cherry MX switches, so click the sponsor link in the description for more information. Excellent! Well, it kind of seems like AMD waited for the perfect time to introduce the Ryzen Plus Vega processors that I'm reviewing today, the Ryzen 3 2200G and the Ryzen 5 2400G. That's because it's never been more challenging to build a budget gaming computer. GPU prices are ridiculous, memory prices are just as bad, and there's a whole generation of new PC gamers who just want to build a computer and play some freaking video games already. So these are APUs, possibly the answer to that dilemma. They're accelerated processing units, according to AMD, which means that there is a quad-core CPU and a Vega-based GPU included in each of these chips. So while you'll still need to buy a DDR4 memory, you can at least get by without a graphics card and still play games. For today's video, I'll be sharing some gaming and performance benchmark numbers for both of these new APUs, but my goal is to answer a few simple questions. Are these viable for 1080p gaming? Can you play currently popular games with them? And how do they stack up to other budget gaming alternatives? So let's start off by taking a quick look at the specs. The Ryzen 3 2200G is only $99 MSRP, and it's a quad-core CPU without SMT, so four cores and four threads. The CPU has a base clock of 3.5 GHz, and XFR will peg one or two of those cores to up to 3.7 GHz under load if temperatures aren't too hot. Officially, the 2200G has a 65 watt TDP, although it's variable according to AMD, 45 to 65 watts is what they actually list. That's because the heat output of any given processor will change depending on the CPU and GPU clock speed. So if you overclock it, TDP goes up. If you underclock it or run it at a lower frequency, TDP might go down. The AM4 platform that these APUs slot into does support CPUs with up to a 95 watt TDP. So depending on the power delivery hardware in your chosen motherboard, you should have some overclock headroom. And I'm not going to be overclocking today, just FYI, but the CPU and GPU in both of these chips are both unlocked, and I do have a full build plan that I will be giving the OC treatment to in the future. The 2200G's integrated GPU is classified as Vega 8. It runs at 1100 MHz by default with 8 compute units, 512 ALUs, 32 texture mapping units, and raw graphics compute power of 2.25 teraflops floating point 16. The Ryzen 5 2400G will cost you a bit more. It's $169 MSRP, and it is also a quad-core CPU, but it has simultaneous multi-threading, so it provides eight threads for your operating system to work with. Base clock is 3.6 gigahertz, and boost clock is 3.9 gigahertz, when temperatures permit, of course. It's also fully unlocked for CPU and or GPU overclocking with a 65 watt TDP, and the GPU and the 2400G is a Vega 11, running at 1,250 megahertz by default, with 11 compute units, 704 ALUs, 44 texture mapping units, and raw graphics compute power of 3.52 teraflops, floating point 16. Let's move into some comparison benchmarks, and I do still run all my benchmarks fresh. All of these were handled just in this past weekend. I will add some extra CPU comparisons when I'm specifically looking at CPU performance charts, but for gaming, I wanted to do a current test of the best iGPU that Intel offers on the desktop side, which right now is the Intel UHD Graphics 630 that you can find on Coffee Lake chips. I used my 8700K for this, and while this was mostly for the gaming numbers of the iGPU, please bear in mind when we get to the 3 d Mark physics and CPU tests that the 8700K costs more than double what the 2400G costs, and almost four times the cost of the $100 2200G, so please bear that in mind. That said, I also added a GTX 1050 Ti to the Intel platform and ran numbers on that as well, and that's a because that's apparently the lowest power discrete GPU that I actually have on hand right now. I know a GT 1030 from NVIDIA would probably be a more apt discrete GPU comparison here, but I've never once recommended that GPU to anyone. I wanted kind of a more real low-end budget GPU option that I've recommended to people, so that's why I chose the GTX 1050 Ti. Also bear in mind, it costs well over $200 right now, so it also costs more than either of these APUs, and um, that is $50 to $100 more than the 1050 Ti's MSRP, which should be more like $150-ish. Anyway, my Intel testbed used an ASUS ROG Strix Z370-i gaming motherboard, a Samsung 960 Pro 512 gig NVMe SSD, and 16 gigs of G-Skill Flare X DDR4 memory set to its DDR4 3200 CAS Latency 14 XMP setting. 
My Ryzen test bed was based on the Gigabyte AB350N gaming Wi-Fi mini ITX motherboard. It also used a Samsung 960 Pro 512 gig NVMe SSD and the same 16 gig G Skill Flare X DDR4 memory kit, also set to the same DDR4 3200 cast latency 14 XMP settings. I made absolutely sure to use the exact same memory with the exact same speed because the iGPUs use the system memory for graphics memory and that can very much affect your graphics performance. So let's jump into the benchmarks. I've got CPU focused, gaming focus, and I'll end with some actual footage of gameplay testing and uh, some testing of what settings you need to go with to actually play some of these games at 1080. Starting off with Cinebench, the multi-threaded test, which saw the 2200G with all four cores scoring 565 points and the 2400G scoring 816 because it has quad core with multi-threading. If we move over to the single thread tests, you can tell when you're comparing this to some of the mainstream Ryzen stuff, single thread performance should be roughly in the same ballpark. In fact, if you're running this at the same frequency as say an 1800X, you should get almost exactly the same results. 145 and 152 were the scores for the 2200G and 2400G respectively. Moving over to CPU mark, this is the CPU test specifically and the overall score for the 2400G was 10,220 with a single thread score coming in at 1,972. You can see the slight variance here again with the single threaded tests um, and this is again mainly because the 2400G is running about 200 megahertz faster frequency on the single core than the 2200G. Let's move over to Blender, a bit more of a practical test here. Um, when testing the Splash Fishy Cat demonstration, we saw a total time of just over 60 seconds for the 2400G, and then ramped that up to 73.2 seconds for the 2200G. I will say, looking at these CPU numbers right out of the gates, um, they're not bad by any stretch. Of course, if you're comparing them to the higher end stuff that you can get on the Ryzen platform, or especially the higher end stuff that Intel offers, the numbers for the APUs aren't gonna be quite as impressive, but you have to keep the price in mind and also the fact that these come with a GPU integrated, which many of these comparison CPUs do not. Finally, for CPU specific tests, here's the Blender BMW 27 tests. And here you can see that as you're moving to longer tests, or if you're comparing this to say, uh, rendering video or something like that, when you go from four cores and four threads to something with six cores or eight cores or beyond, you get a vast reduction in your actual compute time. And here is probably the best example of where you might tell someone who's gonna consider one of these APUs for something that's more CPU compute oriented, uh, maybe, opt for something with a higher core count because you're going to get more benefit out of that. That said, these APUs are still, of course, perfectly viable for doing stuff like working with render or video editing. You're just going to be waiting more time for your project to render out. Moving over to some gaming tests now and starting with the 3D Mark Fire Strike Synthetic. This is just standard Fire Strike. And here again, I wanna point out that when you're looking at overall scores and physics scores, the 8700K tests have a huge advantage and that's largely because it's on a much more expensive platform. So I'm in no way see, trying to tell you guys that these are directly comparable CPUs. I just wanted to include all of these scores so that the the charts will line up and everything. And mainly here you want to look at the graphics tests. So the UHD 630 graphics test scores a pitiful 1,452. We're getting double that with the 2200G with a score over 3,000 and more than that, 3609 for the 2400G. As we move over to 3D Mark Time Spy, this is a DirectX 12 test. This is also a much more intense test and it was pretty much a slideshow with the APUs as I tested them. However, they were still able to get through it, uh, scoring 1,015 overall for the 2200G, 1,244 for the 2400G. And again, if you compare that to what the iGPU on the 8700K is capable of, 483 total score and the graphics coming in at just 416 shows you the massive advantage that the integrated Vega graphics has compared to what Intel's working with, at least on the current platform. And now onto some actual games. And I've chosen a few here that I found were popular and also playable on lower end systems. So let's start out with Fortnite becoming insanely popular as sort of a uh, player unknown's battlegrounds replacement. And actually playing this a little bit, I had a lot of fun. 
The 2200G though was able to get about 23 frames per second on average, 2400G got up to 29 frames per second on average. Bear in mind this is with the high quality presets and this is mainly set that way to compare it to, as you can see something a little bit more reasonable when it comes to a discrete GPU like the 1050Ti can get around 66 frames per second. Wait just a minute though and I'm gonna be testing this live and I will show you some settings that you can use in order to get a much more playable frame rate out of Fortnite, especially with one of these APUs. Next up is Overwatch, insanely fun game. They keep adding more things to it and more heroes and everything. So I actually need to get back into this. I feel like I haven't played it quite as much, but also really well optimized here. And we got 52 FPS out of the 2200G, 61 out of the 2400G. And this is with the high settings and 100% re render scale. Again, I'll be testing this in just a minute to show you guys some more reasonable settings to use with this game if you want to play at 1080 and get to playable 60 frames per second or better frame rates. Moving over to Player Unknown's Battlegrounds and this game uh, feels like it could use some more optimization. I think it's a much smaller team than the team at Fortnite has working on it, but uh, I was only able to eke out about 23.4 frames per second with the 2200G, just over 30 frames per second with the 2400G. That's at medium settings, so medium, not super high, but still not super low either. Um, this game could probably use a little bit more work or perhaps some driver optimization uh, specifically for these GPUs. Compare that to the 1050 Ti, which is getting 72 frames per second on average and you can see one of the benefits you get by spending more money on a discrete GPU. However, I want to point out there was an issue with the 2400G that I experienced and that I talked to Kyle about and he experienced too, which was stuttering and inconsistency. It's like you'd play the game, it would be okay for 20 seconds and then you'd have three or four seconds where it would slow way down, you get into the single digit frame rates uh, and then it seems like it would recover and it'd go back to a more normal frame rate. This seems very much to me to be something that uh, is probably going to be a driver fix that they need to come out with. That said, if you look at the 1% low numbers on PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds, as well as back on the Fortnite numbers, my 1% lows were less were lower with the 2400G than with the 2200G, and this is representative of those stuttery, inconsistent uh, frame rate points that I, I, I went through. Uh, unfortunately, that made the game very difficult to play, and it did persist through my uh, gameplay testing that we'll get to in just a second. And let's move on to Total Warhammer 2. This was actually benchmarked with the Ultra preset, so that made it much more challenging, as you can see from the frame rate numbers, 2200G, less than 10 FPS, 2400G at 12 FPS. You could get better numbers out of this by changing uh, uh, the actual preset uh, from Ultra down to something a little bit more playable. But I just wanted to point out when you have lots of draw calls, when you have lots of units on the screen, it's going to bog down lower end graphics cards. And especially when you start to get uh, above the actual GPU memory limits, uh, which is one gigabyte by default uh, with the 2200G and 2400G, that's gonna lead to some issues as well. That made Total War Warhammer 2 not very easy to play at all in the APUs and probably something that you'd wanna crank the, those settings way down on to play uh, at, at a more reasonable frame rate. Speaking of reasonable frame rate though, GTA 5 at 1080, uh, doing quite well here. I'll say probably due to game optimizations, but it's also been out for a little while longer, but uh, 44 FPS on average though for the 2200G, 69 FPS for the 2400G, uh, very reasonable 1% low numbers as well. So if you've been itching to play GTA 5 on the PC and you haven't been able to, these are pretty solid choices for that. Bear in mind again, I'm using not the highest settings that I typically do when I test higher, higher in graphics cards. Most of the stuff is set to normal um, with some of the detail levels and that kind of thing turned down. But all of those settings are listed at the bottom if you guys want to check it out. So the next thing I did was some actual play testing and I screen capped this um, and I played three different games, Overwatch, uh, Fortnite, as well as PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds. I did it with the 2200G and the 2400G and I messed with the settings to try to get a frame rate above 60 FPS playing at 1920 by 1080 and wanted to show you guys the actual gameplay as well as what it looks like and the frame counter is in the top left hand corner from Fraps. So starting off with Overwatch, first thing I did was switch from the high preset that I used in the benchmarks I just showed you down to medium. Uh, Overwatch, when I did this, automatically did a 75% scaling as well. So those two combined uh, resulted in pretty consistent mid 60 frames per second gameplay. Um, so the 2200G, I'm happy to say, is perfectly capable of playing Overwatch. Um, you just gotta turn the scaling down a little bit. I don't always like messing with the scaling, but it is definitely a very viable option if you're limited on GPU power. Moving over to Fortnite here, I started with the medium preset and tested that out a little bit and the grass turned off. That can apparently improve frame rates. I was getting mid to low 40 frames per second uh, actual results. So then I switched it down to low. 
uh, but with 100% scaling. And this resulted in a very playable 70 to 80 frames per second, sometimes even getting up to the 100 frames per second range. Um, but Fortnite's uh, thankfully allows you to scale those graphic settings way down. So even with a fairly underpowered system, you're able to get some pretty decent frame rates. Next up is PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds. Very popular, but I already mentioned going through the initial benchmarks that the frame rates were not all that great. Uh, I actually had to crank the 2200G all the way down to the very low setting and crank the scaling all the way down to 70. And still, I was in the mid 40 frames per second range. I did note that it was using all the VRAM, uh, one total gig of VRAM, so that spills over into the supplemental VRAM that uh, these chips are capable of handling, although I'm not delving into that too much for this video. Once you get past that one gig limit, it seems to start to slow things down. And definitely PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds suffers from this. So you're probably gonna have to go below 1080 if you want to get above 60 frames per second if you're using the 2200G and PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds, barring some some driver update that fixes things really well or something like that. Moving up to the 2400G and back over to Overwatch. Uh, here again, I just had to bump down to the medium preset, but I was able to do 100% scaling. So if you're comparing the frame rates that you're seeing here to the 2200G, they're kind of similar, but 100% scaling with the 2400G, 75% scaling with the 2200G. Uh, it was mostly above 60 frames per second, even getting above 70 sometimes, but I will point out that when I got into a more intense firefight, the frame rate would dip down to the mid 40s, so something that you might play around with even more. Uh, thankfully, Overwatch is really good when it comes to graphic settings and getting something that gets you the most frames for your GPU. Uh, did not fortunately suffer from the stuttering that Fortnite and PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds did. Speaking of which, Fortnite. So here is probably your first introduction to these weird stuttering issues. They were sporadic. They would come and go. I could play for a couple minutes and not experience it at all. Just very much an indication that this probably needs some optimization on the driver's side, but definitely frustrating if you're playing this and it happens at the wrong time right as you're going to try to kill someone. Not that I was able to kill anyone, I'm horrible at all of these games. Uh, I started at medium, I was getting in the mid to high 40 frames per second range. I turned the view distance and anti-aliasing down and I was able to get to just under 60 frames per second, but eventually I just switched back to low, same setting I was using with the 2200G with 100% scaling. And there I was getting around 80 FPS, sometimes going over 100, but again, every so often would encounter those stutters that made playing pretty difficult. And finally, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Uh, here, I eventually, after testing a couple things, realized like, you know what, I wasn't getting very good frame rate with a 2200G, so just redo those settings. Very low, with 70% scaling, still only getting in the 40 to 50 frames per second range, and still plagued pretty regularly by those uh, weird hiccups and stutters, FPS dipping down to the single digit range, happened the most, in my opinion, in Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. So hopefully a software or driver update will fix this, since I didn't really notice these hiccups and stutters with the 2200G. So before wrapping up, I had a few random notes that I wanted to point out, just things that appeared to me that I found interesting. First off, there's no temperature control knob on this one or offsets. Uh, Threadripper, as well as the mainstream Ryzen CPUs, have a temperature offset that tricks your system into cranking up your fan speed so that the CPU will be at a lower temperature and it will overclock itself more. Not the case on these APUs. What you see is what you get. The video outs, I was actually asked about lots of video outs on existing B350 and X370 motherboards. What do they actually support? If you're at 1080p, you can go all the way up to 240 hertz. So if you're playing like a CSGO or something like that, that is good to know. 1440p, you can go up to 144 hertz, and at 4K, you can go up to 60 hertz, and that's just default out of the video outs back here, um, which includes, on this motherboard, at least an HDMI and a display port. Bear in mind that these APUs are compatible with FreeSync, however, FreeSync requires display port. So if you're getting one of these APUs, and like a cheap FreeSync monitor, which is a great idea, make sure that your motherboard has a display port out. That's very important. As for temperatures, and in case I didn't point it out clearly enough already, uh, I wanted to use everything the way it comes, so I've been cooling these with the Wraith Stealth coolers that came in the box with either of these APUs. Uh, it did an okay job. 2200G was pretty reasonable. Temperatures were typically in the low 60 Celsius range, peaking at about 70 degrees Celsius. 2400G, however, ran much warmer. Um, that's probably due to the higher clock speeds, simultaneous multi-threading, uh, more GPU compute units. 70 degrees Celsius was more common on average, and 87 degrees Celsius was what the CPU got to max. 77 degrees Celsius was the max that the GPU got to. And bear in mind that those temperatures are taken into account when it comes to XFR. So you might induce throttling in some situations 
if you're using the 2400G with the Wraith Stealth cooler. So these APUs would probably benefit from an aftermarket cooler, especially if you're gonna be overclocking, and especially if you're overclocking the CPU and the iGPU. All right, so let's talk pros and cons. I'm gonna start with the negatives. 2400G and its stuttering issues definitely stood out the most to me. It was just a little bit disappointing when it comes to the performance, but again, probably just a driver update issue that will hopefully be addressed very soon by AMD. I also wanna point out that the Wraith Stealth, while being a perfectly adequate, out of the box included cooler, uh, just not quite capable of handling the 2400G at full throttle. Uh, so high temperatures might limit performance, especially if you're in a more tight enclosure with less airflow. I was testing all these just in open test beds. High temperatures do limit performance and definitely limits the ability for XFR to do its job and crank those clock speeds up. The best performance also with these APUs, and this is just applies to Ryzen in general, requires high-speed DDR4. Even more so applies when that high-speed DDR4 is being used as the GPU's memory as well, and that's just still very expensive. So you're gonna wanna pick and choose and find yourself some 2933 or 3200 speed memory, and finding a good deal on that is pretty challenging right now. Moving over to positives though, excellent performance per dollar for 1080p gaming, and you don't need to buy a graphics card. And I will say, especially from the $99 2200G. If I had one takeaway from this whole thing, it's that the 2200G at $99 seems like a great deal, and the 2400G at $170 seems like an okay deal. Uh, the improvement that you get for the 2400G just isn't insanely that much better, at least according to my numbers today. And the 2200G, 99 bucks, that's $99 for this, and then like $99 for this motherboard, and that's your GPU, your CPU, and your motherboard for 200 bucks. Pretty reasonable. Extremely budget friendly, especially in today's GPU pricing environments, and definitely a lot of fun mini ITX build potential, I think, coming up too. Uh, the upgrade path, I also wanted to point out, it slots into AM4, so you can get one of these little $99 APUs with a GPU in it, slot it into, say, a higher-end X370 motherboard, and you'll have an upgrade path in the future to get yourself like an 1800X, or even one of the Ryzen 2 CPUs that AMD is promising will come out soon like in the next month or two, I think. But guys, that is going to wrap it up for this video on the new AMD Ryzen APUs, the Ryzen 3 2200G and the Ryzen 5 2400G. Really nice performance, I'm impressed. I hope you guys are impressed too. And uh, leave me a thumbs up button on this video if you enjoyed it. And of course, your comments are always welcome down in the comments section below. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have any ideas, if you're planning on buying one. Uh, I'll put links to these in the video's description. So if you guys wanna click those also, very much appreciated. One last thing, uh, I've been kind of back in some of the swing of things this week with videos, and I wanted to say a big thank you to any of you guys who have come out and been like, hey, yeah, go Paul, or we missed you or anything like that. It's really been helpful as I've been getting back in the swing of things, and um, it, it makes, it warms the cockles of my heart. Okay, I finished this video off by saying cockles, I should end now. Anyway though guys, I've said enough already. Thank you again for watching this video, and we'll see you next time.